Oh, froze for a sec though. Hopefully it unfreezes. Come on, computer. I wonder if it's the proximity. If Here, I, I'm, I'm gonna try one thing. I'm gonna roll my whole desk closer that way and see if I have a better connection. So I'm. You want to take a look at the camera to see if the angle's good? Yep. You look good, in my opinion. Oh, <laughs> thank you, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> How was the show? It was honestly one of the best experiences because, like, you're in a freaking million, like a villa that costs millions, and everything's paid for, food's paid for, everything's paid for. You're just there to chill. So, I didn't think about judo. I didn't think about anything. So I was just right. really nice to not think about So how long were you there? Eight, eight weeks. Really? Like, because we had to quarantine and then it was 10 days of quarantine. Then they extended my quarantine for three weeks because mm -hmm. I got COVID. Mm -hmm. Oh, you did? Um, yeah. So you got COVID while you were there. So eight weeks in a beautiful place, fully paid for with some other when attractive I COVID, people. I was like locked in an Airbnb. I couldn't leave. I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Um but then after I went in the villa, it was really good. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I brag a little bit. I'm like, yeah, I'm in the finals. I'm in the final block and everything. So <laughs> So did you win? Is it a win? Uh, Do you win this thing? No, I lost. Well, basically, it's only one winner. The, the couple that wins gets uh -huh. the $50,000. I got, yeah, I was in the finals, but I didn't win. So what do you get? You just get the vacation then? Pretty much. Well, we get right. paid like weekly, but it's like nothing. It's like $200 a week. So Okay. And then what's the point of the show? Because I haven't seen it, obviously, in French. <laughs> Is the point to fall in love? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's like just to find love. And like, there's a thing, um, you can only talk about love and the cameras are on 24-7. So like, there's nothing else to talk about. So it's what? basically, yeah, no Wi-Fi, no phone, no nothing. So like, uh -huh. you're mentally like going crazy a little bit. So right. It's like, that's why there's drama and everything. So it's, it's, a, it's a reality TV show. You know? right, 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 right. And your brother obviously enjoyed it. That, the, the only reason I went is because Mohab did it. And then, yeah, uh, yeah. it's kind of like judo. I did judo because Mohab did it. So I'm following right. Mohab. Yeah. Right. And they messaged me. They're like, it'd be cool if there's two brothers on the show. That never happened. So I was like, right. sure. And I did it. And that's, that's why I did it. Right. Sweet. And then, yeah, and I guess you just got back like a week or so ago. Yeah, yeah. Literally a week ago. Nice. Sweet, man. Well, that's all right. I'm a little jealous. I'm hoping I want to go on a vacation like next June, but it's not for a year. I got, yeah, you know, life, work, children. How's, how's the, the new, well, new lifestyle? Good. Uh, it's, it's crazy. There's like uh, up here, like there's, there's life changes that are different, which is like, it's cold. It's not like cold. It's like cold. Yeah. yeah. Um, but one thing that's interesting is like when you think about how much sunlight there is or isn't, um, we have a lot less hours of sunlight for a period of time in the winter. But in Ontario and Quebec, it's always cloudy. It snows. It rains. It's muck. Up here, it's almost desert-like. So it rarely snows. What happens is when snow falls, it never leaves, right? Like So you yeah. get snow end of October, start of November. It's there. It doesn't snow very often. So that means the sky's clear all the time. So you have less hours that sunlight's available, but most days the sky's clear. And when it gets really, really cold, any moisture in the air immediately freezes. Yeah. So, so you have clear skies all the time because you'll have like minus 40 with wind chill. So yeah. it's too cold to snow. It's too cold for clouds. <laughs> so the coldest days are shockingly beautiful. They're stunningly bright. Um, yeah, so that's neat. And then when you get to this time of year, almost every day is perfect weather. It's same thing because we don't get a lot of rain, super clear skies, tons of sun. It's not dark at 2 a.m. It's like dusk. Yeah. So uh, you'll have like it'll be 11 at night and you don't know if it's 7 p.m. or 11. And uh, when that's you, if, cool, yeah, yeah. And if you wake up at five, six in the morning, it's bright out. So like if you like going out periodically, not that it's a huge party, but like because yeah. it's only 20,000 people. But you go on a patio and it could be 10 at night and it's not dark and you're having a pint. It's like it's really it's, it's really nice that way. I'll come visit then. I have to see. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, I, this coming year, we're planning uh, every year. I'm going to be bringing athletes and people up. Um, so this year, for sure, I want to bring up this woman named Friba Rezi, who I recorded for the podcast. I don't know if you've heard of her. Um, she's from Afghanistan, first ever female Olympic athlete from there. Amazing woman. She's like connecting 
girls in Afghanistan with mentors around the world and getting them education. And she's actually got some girls like full scholarships to come to school here. And this is at a time when you can't do school past grade six. Yeah. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. She's really, she's awesome. And she lives in BC. Like, how did I not know who she was? Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, I didn't know about her until your podcast, honestly. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Amazing. So yeah. So she's someone I'm bringing up, but for sure, obviously, like I'd be super excited to bring you up and talk to the kids and all that kind of stuff. This episode is brought to you by the Northwest Territories Judo Association. I am proudly the executive director and head coach. Our focus is on making judo accessible throughout the territory, developing students from grassroots to high performance. We're incredibly fortunate to have the support of school districts, town, recreational programs, as well as the territorial government. Please check us out at any one of the links listed below. If you don't watch judo, uh, then you may not know who Shadi Al Nahaz is. If you do watch judo, then you know who he is for sure. Um, not only are you a great judoka at a very young age, but the way that you do judo is with such excitement. There's so much excitement around your matches. Um, this is why I called you the Canadian gunslinger because, you know, not only do you throw people, but with such like exuberance and the throws are so massive and your signature technique, um, Surigoshi is just such a huge hip throw. And, and we've seen, um, was it the Montreal Grand Prix where you just had an absolutely insane exchange with Trey Carver through Trey. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then some of the other really exciting wins, but like you've won the Pan Ams twice, I believe. And three times. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Trois fois. And, wow. and as well, uh, he ended up getting some revenge at the Olympic Games, but you've also defeated George Fonseca, who's a two-time world medalist and an Olympic bronze medalist and uh, had an, a really incredible clash in that, in that bronze medal match. And I guess the connection with us that's so nice and I feel so fortunate and exciting for me is watching you grow up in the province that I was living in and where I was living. I was living in Toronto for the last uh, like dozen years or so before I came up here. So watching you grow up from this child that was always like talented in judo to seeing you compete at the Olympic games and the world championships, there's this community connection, even past just judo and past being Canadian of even being in the same city. And then moreover, I was fortunate enough that the CBC asked me to commentate those games. So I got to, I got to commentate uh, the Olympics while you smash people left, right, and center. So it was, it was a pretty exciting, uh, a really exciting week. So thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I don't, I don't think people know, but we've known each other for a very, very long time. Like you said, since I was a kid. So it's kind of, it's kind of full circle now, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. I, I talked to some of my um, friends about that, um, you know, in judo, in a lot of ways, it's sort of a small community it's big because there's lots of people that do it. And, and globally, it's massive. People do it all over the world. But people, at once you get to a certain level, the community sort of shrinks to some degree. And one thing I was talking about, some of, like some of my really close friends, like Nick Tritton and Sergio Pessoa, who I started Matsudo Canada with, and Sasha Lemontang is this small group of close friends of mine that I've known since we were 12 to 16 in that range are working in the judo community full time, which is really exciting. And then in that same world is seeing kids like you grow up and having that connection and be some of the, not just the best judoka in the country, but on the planet is, is such an exciting thing to watch happen. Yeah. Honestly, I feel like I like seeing that people after they retire too, they're still in the judo community some way, somehow. And I think that's, that's uh, what I'm going to do. Honestly, I want to like, like you, like Sergio, like everybody, I want to always keep judo in my life somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the things that motivates me to stay in it is in North America, especially, we always we have this insecurity about judo, that not enough people do it, that it could die, that it could go away. I think that's unfounded, but it's not as popular as other sports. And I think part of the reason is people love judo so much, and they're so passionate about it, that people volunteer all this time to build it. But the more people that can actually make a living off of it, not ripping people off but people that can make a, a healthy decent living doing judo helps promote judo so much more and i think it's an integral part of the growth that it 
gives kids the idea that if I want to do this professionally, I can do it. And it allows people to stay connected without it only being in the spare time when you have a life, you know, you have children eventually or family or all these kinds of things. So I think the professional aspect of judo is integral in, in continuing to grow judo here. So it's, it's exciting for me to know that that's what you want to do in the long run when you retire from competition. A hundred percent. Cause I think that judo is my job right now. It's my only source of income mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I can, I, I'm, li I'm living good. So right. it shows that it can be, can be your, your job. And then of course, when I retire, I can still integrate into like something else, right. including, you know, right. So, uh, how old were you actually when you started judo? Uh, honestly, it was like a little bit of, I started at four years old when I was in Egypt yeah. Then I quit. I quit after a few years because I hated it. The right sided and I had to switch to left sided because my brother would bocker for four years. And then when I moved, when I moved to Canada, that's when I started judo again. And that's when I was like, okay, I'm actually better than I think. And I can actually go far in the sport. Right. So you were like uh, eight or nine or so. And then obviously you were doing it with your brother who, um, I'm not sure what his rank in the world right now is. You just recently changed divisions from 90 to 81 kilos, but I, I did speak to him right during the games where he had, he was looking at changing weight divisions. And I know he's had some uh, success changing down to 81 already in his first year, getting ready for the new Olympic qualification cycle. So uh, yeah. So for, again, people that may not be aware, not only are you a world-class player, but your brother is, is quite a stellar judoka in his own right. Yeah, Mohab uh, was uh, moved up to 90 a few years ago, but he was never a real 90. He was always 86 kilos, 87. So he never was, he never had the, the, the right weight. He never cut weight for 90. So going back to 81, I think, was a smart move because the first tournament he does, he wins a gold medal. So I think it was the right move. And I'm very excited to see how uh, his Olympic qualifications are going to start and how he's going to roll because I think he's going to outclass everybody and he's going to, he's going to like, I'm, I think I'm good, but just wait till my brother starts, uh, starts his role, you know, it will right. be, be different. Right. Yeah. It's so exciting. Uh, Canada famously had two brothers compete at uh, the same kind of level back in the nineties, which was Keith and Colin Morgan, who are twins actually out of, um, out of Calgary. Keith, continued on he ended up getting a fifth place at the world and i think a fifth at the olympics and his brother colin stopped at a little younger age um but um yeah it's nice to see two brothers from canada uh performing at that level and same thing i've i've known mohab obviously a long time too and just like such a great guy it's always nice to connect with him so um yeah so it's it's always exciting to see people that you've seen grow up and people that you respect and people that are good people succeed yeah, yeah um yeah go ahead no, no, just I was gonna say, yeah, like Mohab's probably the most passionate human being that to ever love judo. I've never seen somebody love judo like that. So I think it's his time to to show off and show out. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm excited to see. We have the new qualification window starts um like end of this month or July. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's exciting to see. What what's your um what's your upcoming when do you start really hitting the tour again? Well, of course, I had a small break because of uh, the show I was doing. So I'm going to start. My first tournament will be at the Commonwealth Games. Gotcha. So I'll do that. I don't think it's Olympic qualification points, but it's a nice way to start getting back into in, in, in shape. So mm -hmm. that'll be my first competition. And then we'll see as it goes after my how I do. Uh, this has been a little annoying already. Yeah, but it's okay. It's okay. Um. I'm just going to pin you again before I get you to tell me that schedule. Yeah. So you're, so Commonwealth games, you have Commonwealth games coming up. When, when is that? Uh, end of July. Beginning oh, okay. of August type. Uh, so I'll do that. See how I feel. And right. then, yeah, I want to more start picking and choosing my, my tournaments because mm -hmm. last Olympic qualification, I just burned myself out. I did every single competition. I was injured everywhere. Uh, so this time I want to pick and choose. And uh, for example, I'll do like masters, I'll medal. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of points. And then I can take my time and pick and choose more than just burn myself out every time. Right. Yeah. I think it's like a, a common thread, which can be a, a double-edged sword is that 
when you need qualification points, you want to make sure you make the game. So you hit all of these events, but then hitting so many events can lead to burnout, can lead to exhaustion, can lead to even a lack of desire because you're on the road so much. You have all these time changes, like um, so many of the international events, the vast majority are in European time. So you're flying to Europe, you're flying back, your sleep's getting messed up, all of that's affecting performance. Um, but you, it sort of feels like a necessary evil, especially because you have these points that you need to get. So once you're at the point where you're so confident, you can. Yeah. yeah. Like for me, I was uh, eighth or seventh in the world at the Olympic qualifications at the time. And I didn't want to leave the top eight because if you're top eight, you're seated. Mm -hmm. So I burned myself out. I think I took 46 planes in 2020, something like that. It was ridiculous. Yeah. So I don't want to do that again. You know? Yeah. That's crazy. That's yeah. yeah like it's funny. I, I, I uh, went to an international event with uh, Solomon in Axon Provence in uh, the South of near Marseille in France. And for me personally, I couldn't sleep. I remember, you know, just that time change can mess you up so bad. I, I, I had gone to Scotland the year before. It was totally fine. We go to France and I was saying, okay, I'm not going to nap because I want to make sure I fall asleep at night. And then it would get to night and then I'd fall asleep and I'd wake up at 4 a.m. and I couldn't get back to sleep. And then I'd be sitting in the lobby for two hours working and I never came back around. So the whole yeah. week, every night I couldn't, I wouldn't nap because I'm like, eventually I'm going to fall asleep. And it just didn't, it didn't balance. And, and I think that's something that's not, um, people on the outside looking in, it's not always taken into account. Like the travel schedule can really affect you in dramatic ways. Uh, so Ashley Solomon is uh, a Dianess training right now. Uh, I saw him yesterday. Oh, nice. Uh, I'll fight him for you though tonight. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Just give yeah, him a nice city go shoot for me. I, I, I got you. 100%. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, yeah, everything affects it. Because usually for me, I'm, I don't have the best sleep anyways. So mm-hmm. when I travel, it's even harder to, to manage my, because if we, if we travel for competition, it's just a week. It usually right. takes me a week to, to adjust, you know? Right. So I'm getting better at it, but at the same time, yeah, it does affect your, your competition sometimes. Right. And then um, Worlds this year, are they back to the fall, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's in October. Right. Yeah. Back to the schedule. It got a little wonky there because of the delays with COVID and then we had a really weird thing where they ended up wanting to have the world's done. So then they did the yeah. world championships in June and you had the Olympics in late July, which that was, was yeah, it's yeah. wild. Like as an athlete, how did that feel knowing that the two most important tournaments that you can have are within a month and a half of each other and not like kind of important, the Olympics and the world championships. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I would say no comment, but at the same time, I think this was just ridiculous. It was, it was really ridiculous. I think it was just to push people to, compete to have their last points to to be safe but at the same time people like me for example i was i was okay i was seventh in the world and i was in a good positioning for the olympics Mm -hmm. but i was forced to go to the world championships to solidify my spot because kyle reyes was uh my teammate in 100 um just got into qualifications and there was this rule that judo canada made that if i leave the top eight and even if I'm top eight or uh, ninth in the world and Cal just got in, we'd have to have a fight off. So right. that's the only reason why I did world championships to avoid a fight off. Cause I was like, it's a month apart. I don't want to have a fight world championships, fight off Olympics. Right. So I did it. I did. It's my best world championships. It's my second world championships, but mm-hmm. I didn't know. But at the same time, uh, it, I beat, a guy who beat me four times. So I think it was good motivation. It, like it all worked out eventually. Who is that that it beat you four times that you beat? Uh, the Russian Adam Yen. I fought oh, him yeah. four times and every time I was getting closer. But then World Championships, I was like, okay, now it's now or never. And right. Yeah. yeah, the the one thing I was, I was curious about and one thing that I felt going into the Olympics, which agreed, I thought it was um, from an international judo federation standpoint, you're sort of putting athletes in a tough spot in having to literally peak for performance in two, uh, in two months, less than two months, uh, with such high impact, uh, and high, high import, uh, 
events is that there was a couple people that had really good performances. And so what I, I often think about the confidence of the athlete. And so for one, for an example with you as a cadet and then a junior, you performed very well. But the thing that's interesting is the success often begets success. So when you had these successes as a cadet and a junior, that made you more confident and that confidence builds more confidence. Um, one thing that's really interesting is as good as you were internationally as a cadet and as a junior, you see lots of people where they sort of get to a stage and hold on to it. And I think as a judoka, your judo has just gotten better every stage, which you don't often see, which is really awesome to see. And I think a factor of that is confidence. And when I watched those worlds and I saw the performance of yourself and Jessica Klimkate, a part of me went, okay, it's a really tough spot to go in, but riding the success of what you did, which was, I believe you took fifth at those worlds, right? Fifth place finish at those worlds, which is an amazing, amazing result. And for a lot of people that don't know, the world championships is often a in some ways harder event than the Olympics because you might have two people from a lot of countries like Japan uh, and the divisions are much bigger. So it often requires more. So uh, Jessica Klimkate wins those world championships, second Canadian ever to do it, second woman ever beating her, her teammate uh, yeah. who won the world's, the, the world's before. Um, so her riding that success into the Olympics and you riding this fifth place finish at Worlds into the Olympics may have benefited you. Uh, I don't know if you feel that way in hindsight now, but you're going to go, if you take fifth at those Worlds and you're going into the Olympics, what better way to say I clearly have a chance at meddling than, yeah. than having that result? Honestly, it was, it was, like I said, me, first of all, participating at World Championships, I was kind of annoyed doing mm -hmm. it, but I had to do it. But then once I competed and I saw my result, I was like, okay, this is, this is good motivation. And it took me a long way to, I think at the Olympics up until my last fight, it was my best performance of my life up until the last fight. Mm -hmm. But I think that that performance came from world championships. Right. Right. You're riding that success. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and that confidence. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what a, the, the, my, my only frustration is that getting access to some of those matches like i can't watch those olympics now i don't think yeah uh tv uh, right because because they, they pull it so even the youtube videos are gone now which is yeah. which is sad and um yeah because just such an amazing day leading in and then um i guess we should talk about the match that happened which is the bronze medal match so bronze medal match you fight against george fonseca who is the two-time defending world champion uh uh he's he's interesting just seeing him because you might not have an assessment of his of his physical what's the word i want to say prowess or his like athleticism he's an incredibly athletic guy uh and he's another guy like if i was to make a list of the people that throw biggest on the international tour, independent of weight class on the men's side, you and George are in that top five for sure. Shohei Otani is another one. His throws are humongous. So it was like such a clash of like throwing Titans in this bronze medal match. Uh, I had beaten him two times before uh, in Tokyo and in Zagreb, uh, Grand Slam. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the Olympics, I, I actually watched the fight for the first time last, uh, like, two months ago. Uh, I couldn't watch it before because every time, I'm, like, I would think about watching it, it would break my heart. Right. Uh, I watched the fight. I felt like I was dominating most of the fight. Mm -hmm. And then he's he's such, such an explosive guy. Like, he's yeah. really explosive. Last 30 seconds, I think he was just gassed out. I can hear him wheezing. So yeah. he just gave one last shot, and he, he caught me. Right. Yeah, it was. It's, it's it happens. So I, I I don't know. I lost focus for a second. I, I got over too confident, and then I yeah. tried to rush it, and then he got me, and then just defensive mode the whole time. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, and then right at the end, it was like right at the end too. Oh, there was. It was so close, and I was like, I was like uh, trying to call this, and also vibrating in my chair, just <laughs> like, you know, like I'm not really supposed to cheer, but also cheering, and so. Uh, it was like, I mean, it's about as exciting as a thing as you can do is to call that match to the audience of, of Canada. But yeah, um, it was also obviously heartbreaking for me too, you know? And, and one thing that was 
that was a really amazing about these Olympics is going into these Olympics, my hope, and I believed for sure, is that I hoped and believed that we'd have some Canadians that would fight for a medal. And I was really hoping, I hope two Canadians fight for a medal. And when you look back, you had four Canadians fight for a medal, two medaled, and one of them wasn't even, one, one of the people that you would have picked was Antoine Vawa Fortier, who didn't end up being in that position yeah. to compete for a medal. And it just shows how strong that team was. And, and my hope is how that team continues to be. But Arthur had a really spectacular day where he came back from being down late in the second round and came back to win a match, which was like so exciting. And Kat BP had a really emotional victory where she's been yeah. flirting with, with a world international medal at the Olympics or worlds for a number of years and Jessica meddling and um, yeah, it would have been really nice to have two medals on the men's side, but it was also pretty spectacular to see. <laughs> yeah. I think Arthur and I had pretty much identical days sort of because he fought, he lost to a Georgian. I lost to a Georgian in the quarters. Uh, we beat an Israeli in the repechage and then we both get fifth. Right. Uh, so it's kind of, it's kind of ironic. Right. But yeah. Honestly, I think also the Olympics, because of COVID wasn't what it was supposed to be. Like we didn't do any of the opening ceremony or the closing ceremony. Right. So I think the vibe was very different. Mm -hmm. I feel like 2024 for if Arthur and I go, mm -hmm. it's going to be completely different and uh, in a good way, I think. Because it was mm -hmm. kind of put us down, not being able to do anything at the Olympics and staying in the rooms and all of that. Right. So 2024, I think uh, it's going to be absolutely insane. Yeah, I'm, I, uh, it's not confirmed, but it looks like I'll be getting to call those games again, which I'm so excited about. And it's good when you called it. So let's do that again. I'm yeah, done. yeah, exactly. Maybe we'll just, if, if you just tell everybody that I'm it, without me, you probably like just as a good luck charm, not yeah. as a, you know. together, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very important. We've never had a result like that and I've never called the games before. So it obviously is because I called them. Yeah, I, I think so too. Right. So my, my hope is I don't know if I'll get to, especially post COVID. I don't know if they'll actually send me to Paris or not, but either way, I I'm, I'm really hoping to get to call it. I'm sure, I'm sure I'll be calling a lot of exciting matches and hopefully you'll be at the, the top this time. Okay. Um, the, the two things that stand out is one of the things that you mentioned is for, from a judo standpoint, I don't know how, how much time you've actually spent in Georgia. I haven't been there myself of you've competed. You won. I won the uh, Tbilisi Grand Slam. Right. Um, so Georgia not only produces some of the most incredible judo in the world with a population of 8 million people, yeah. but when you look at world champions from other places, they're Georgian. You have yeah. Shirazadashvili, who's a Georgian, who was the first Spanish world champion. You have Ilias Iliadis, who was everyone's favorite judoka forever, who's a <laughs> Georgian who fought for Greece. Yeah. You have uh, a Dutch 60-kilo player, I think that's a Georgian. That's like, yeah, very, I, know what you're I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And you have a French guy on the French national team who's Georgian and it's just insane. It's like, they have some kind of like a press that just produces the best judoka in the world. And they just, Oh, there's too many good ones in Georgia. So they'll just be the world champions from other places. It's incredible. I think it's just their culture to be fighters. So the amount of partners and bodies they have is insane. And mm -hmm. they're always like, I think it's instilled in them to have the warrior mindset. So right. they're just, they're, they're made to fight type of thing. So right. that's, why, that's why they have so many good athletes. It's incredible. Like it's, com it's completely insane. And then, yeah, like there's just, it's just such a hotbed for judo. There's like three countries like that, that stand out to me. Um, one is more recent. The other two have a long history. Georgia has a very long history of a lot of success for a very small population. Mongolia. Uh, I think there's 3 million people only in Mongolia and same thing, just incredible judo. Their women's side is very strong. The, uh, in Georgia, you're, they're just starting to develop their women's team. Um, but the women's side in Mongolia is just as strong as the men's side. And the other one that stands out to me is you look at the last 12 years of success out of Israel and same thing, small population base, 8 million people, super tough, incredible program. They just produce like they had um, 2016 Olympics. They had a 66 kilo player who's ranked number one in the world. And I can't think of his name right now. He gets upset. He goes out a year later, they have another guy fill in and he becomes number one in the world at 66 kilos. Yeah. Like it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's crazy. 
it's uh i think also in uh, israel it's like the the sport is kind of it's, it's famous like everybody from right. the, that team is a superstar in israel right so i think it's uh, it's the country it's how the country sees the sport a little bit right and if they're gonna put more effort into it but i think for canada for example we're getting better and better and uh it's bound to happen that uh, more help will 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 be brought because mm-hmm. if we keep performing we have really good bodies now we have really good partners we have beautiful the team, facility the team is just going to get better honestly yeah and with the success i mean with the success that we've had as a team or you have had i guess you could say i feel like part of it in a sense yeah, we're but, our team, we're team Canada. Yeah, yeah so with the success that canada's had and the quality of success it's not like boring wins it's like really huge amounts of success recently it's success in an exciting way and in such a a, an, a large amount of it it's going to naturally bring more funding to the sport it's going to bring more private money and sponsorship to the sport which i'm hoping if you don't already that there's a number of private sponsors that go to you and there should hopefully be more so hopefully yeah, uh, yeah. that continues <laughs> um as well as eyes, right? It's like people want to know about a kid from Toronto that's successful and a girl from Whitby and, and some Quebec athletes like uh, in BC, you know, all over the country. Um, people feel a part of that. So I think the success will bring more eyes. It brings more uh, visibility. And then the other thing that's a nice thing that helps is like the one thing the IGF's done in the last 10 years, which is make all of their content high definition, available so people can watch it um if you if you haven't watched shaddy fight and you're listening to the podcast or watching pause it and then watch a bunch of his matches and then come back because like for instance the exchange from the montreal grand prix is one of the most exciting things that can happen in sport it was so wild um yeah super like it's just i mean that's as exciting as things can get in sport yeah, I think it's just fascinating to learn about the sport and seeing how it's evolving. Because mm-hmm. just like any other sport, like for example, MMA, if you watch UFC one comparing to the UFC now, it's it's a different sport. Right. I think with judo, it's the same thing, and it's just gonna keep evolving. Because uh, for example, like we have uh, Keegan Young, and he's mm-hmm. the craziest. He brought he he brings out the craziest moves I've seen. Mm-hmm. And then if he does that on the IJF4 tour, everybody's, their mind will be blown. So right, brother who does really freaky moves now, same right. thing. It's going to be, it's going to be weird. So in a good way. Yeah. Keegan's another kid. I've had uh, a couple of my athletes cause they were around that same weight class. So yeah. uh, I've had a couple athletes compete with and against Keegan a number of times and watching this kid grow up and just talk about when you want to talk about physical freaks of nature, he is a physical freak of nature. I've yeah. never seen anyone packaged as a human <laughs> with so much power. It's freaky. Like it's crazy. He can yeah. just, he lifts up adult men like they're infants. It's, he, it's wild. Like he he's, holds, uh, he's he holds t- the record of bench press and, and the whole INS. And, yeah. Oh yeah. What's he benching about? Like, 160 kilos, something like that. Right. Like, he's and he's about five foot seven. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like just Yeah, it's a good. He's a truck. Like he's a truck. Yeah. It's it's nuts. That he there's a there's a couple of guys that fight heavier weight classes that I would put in that world but not necessarily there that are undersized in terms of height and just physical powerhouses um Christian Toth and Becca Gavinashvili. Yeah, These two yeah. guys. They're like but it's so rare that you see that and, and yeah, he's and and how old's Keegan now? Like 21. Yeah, like he's he's still a kid. Like a kid, it's, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, that's he, why I'm curious for the Olympic qualifications coming up because I want to see who's like how it's gonna roll. Like, it's not even just like about me. It's more about like I want to see Mohab, I want to see Keegan, I want to see how they're all gonna perform. It's kind of right. Like- yeah, and and uh, I'm not giving away a secret here, but Keegan when he fights righties, he basically doesn't lose. Like I remember talking to James Miller, who's the Ontario coach at a period of time. And it had been something like a year and a half where he hadn't lost to a right-handed Jadoka. If you're right-handed and you fight Keegan Young, he's going to throw you for a pawn with Sode Sode Komigoshi. It's almost just, you know, Guaranteed. like that's what's just happening. Like yeah. if you're right-handed, you're going to lose in There's by a huge Sode. Yeah. You know, yeah, I'm lucky I'm left-sided. So I can fight Keegan at training now. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
and similar to his Sode, um, is your Sudigoshi or hip throw with the, the grip mm-hmm. of the belt. Where did that, you have a unique way of doing it based on your physiology. You have this height and this reach and you utilize your hips in such a, a cool way to create this lift that as an outsider looking at, we've never spoken about you using this throw before, but when I watch it, what's interesting is it's mechanically really strong. So when you have that grip and you lean and you're able to gr- create this huge lean, which produces all this lift because of your reach, it looks like you don't have to use a lot of your physicality. You're not exhausting your muscles yep. to get this huge lift. Uh, honestly, yeah. It's like people think it's power that I'm using, but I'm not. I'm just using literally, I'm just tucking my hips under them as low as I can, as deep as I can. And they just roll onto my hips on their back. Mm-hmm. Uh, it kind of became naturally like at, uh, I used to train at the JCCC. That's my club in uh, Toronto. Right. Uh, and I'm more of a type of fighter who's going to improvise and go with the flow mm-hmm. with everything. Of mm-hmm. course, I have a game plan, but when I'm attacking and stuff, it's more with depending on, on the vibe and how I'm feeling and how the other fighter is. And, right. it just, and then I started doing it and then, the more I did it, the more success I got. And it just became something in my arsenal that that's, that's the move I go to. But if, right. if, if every, if all else fails, I'm going to just do that, you know? Right. The, the one other move that stands out and I haven't told you this before, but uh, stood out to me a lot is I've known Arthur Margelli done a long time. So again, Arthur just took fifth at the last Olympics, 73 kilos. Everything about Arthur's judo to me is beautiful. The way that Arthur bows when he enters the mats is beautiful. I really mean that. I t- I've made students watch video of his bow. Everything he does yeah. in judo is like so classy. It's so beautiful. And he has these, um, again, he's another guy who just really sound judo. I used to train with his father when I was at the Shidokan. So he has an unbelievable Uchimata. But my favorite throw of his is Kochi Makikomi. And he has a specific entry into Kochi Makikomi. And there was an event about a year and a half to two years ago where I watched you smash someone with a Kochi Makikomi. And the first thing that I did is I messaged Arthur and I said, <laughs> have you been talking or hanging out with Shaddy? And he said, why? And I said, because the entire exchange, not only his Kochi Makikomi, but everything leading into this Kochi Makikomi looked like a carbon copy of how he does it. He has yeah. this thing where he rips it off. He's a lefty like yourself. He rips off that right collar, makes it look like, I don't want to go too much, but oh, it's hard to get it off. And then immediately recoils into this Kochi Makikomi. And I watched you do it and it looked the exact same. And I just went, he for sure had a conversation with you or you watched him. Cause it looked, ex- it wasn't just that you both did Kochi Makikomi as lefties. It was the way in which you got to it. Well, me, me, I think Arthur is my closest friend at the INS. So me and him are always together. I was talking, we hang out outside of training all the time. Mm-hmm just comes again like i said i flow i improvise i think Mm -hmm. watching i learn from watching people i learn from watching antoine learn from watching my brother right i think just came to me to to copy arthur's coaching and then now now it's my signature move sorry arthur okay now all right you guys may have to have a a coachy battle (laughs) yeah and also i think it's beneficial because i'm 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 a tall guy Mm -hmm. so it's even when people know it's coming they don't know it's coming you know because the right. timing of it is so different from right. a tall person than a short person so mm-hmm. the the other thing um that i find interesting as you know you is like you know that i'm sort of a stat geek kind of guy and i find that kind of information uh is i recently spoke with emilio centracchio i'm not sure if you yeah know yeah, yeah. Him. yeah so he he was working with jessica i'm not sure if his role is expanding with more members in the national team he has a website called judo data and he produces uh, analysis of performance of athletes and success rates of techniques. And he, he produces all of this. And, uh, his sister is also an Olympic medalist and he has a little brother, Luigi, who is now starting to show some form on the international tour. And one thing that him and I talked about that I always find interesting specifically about throws like Ochi, Gari, Koji, Maki, Komi, and Osoto is in judo, we often think about the spectacular nature of forward throws and the success rate of forward throws. Forward throws as in you're throwing your opponent forward. So Koshiguruma, Uchimata, Sewinage, Sudigoshi. But the success rate of backwards throws is often so much higher. It's like it's naturally built in us as judoka to not want to get smashed by an Uchimata. So our weight naturally ends up on our heels. And what you see is when you look at the success rate of like 
Arthur's coach, Imaki Komi, as an example, because he's done it for so long. He's known for having this incredible Uchimata, but his coach, Imaki Komi, produces. Like, yeah. He uses it a third as much and probably gets as many results. And it's really impressive. So that's, that's one thing that stands out too, is when I see someone have a really great backwards throw that they have their way of doing it, it always stands out to me because I think it's like, you know, most dojos or coaches, they often say throw forward and then backward and people back throw forward and then backward. And I think, well, the success is to the back, you know, yeah. like it's, it's Yeah. And I think also in international competitions too, everybody just wants to throw forward mm -hmm. and like not a lot of people, like you said, people do that. You attack forward and you take backwards. I even do that. But at the same time, I think to be out of the norm, you need to have one good backward throw. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and the, the success of those is really building that again, it's not saying going forward and then back is wrong, but it's like, yeah what can make people difficult is when they're odd. So someone having a weird body type, Keegan Young being five foot seven at, at 90 kilos is odd. You're not used yeah. to people being of this height, your height being an advantage using it in odd ways. So when someone goes, instead of always throwing forwards first, I'm going to go backwards, just throws people off. It's like one of those things being left-handed. It is an advantage because there's less yeah. lefties than righties. You look at how many people on the tour are left-handed, probably 30%. What's the success rate? It's at least half, at least yeah. half, right? At least half the podium positions are lefties. So everything that makes someone a little quirky, um, yeah, makes it makes them a little more successful. So yeah, it's, that's one that stands out. But yeah, it stood out so much, like knowing you guys are teammates. I didn't know that you guys were that close. But, I mean, but yeah, just seeing just seeing the way that it implemented, I was like, there's something that happened here with the coach because <laughs> you looked you look like a, a taller, maybe more handsome version of Arthur doing his... <laughs> I won't admit it because he'll think he'll use that against me, but yeah, I copied right. it. Right. Um, I guess the one other thing that I was interested in is um, I'm not, your career is not remotely over, but, and I'm not saying that you'd live with any regret in terms of what you've done to get to this point, yeah. but in hindsight, either what would you, what would you focus more on? Like, what would you put more of your energy into? training wise or judo wise or what do you look to put more of that energy towards going forward honestly i think i burnt myself out i'm gonna say it 100 times i burnt myself out when i was qualifying for the olympics mm -hmm. so it's just more something i regret i don't think i regret anything something i would change uh would be more uh more working in the gym on my stability and everything more than uh more than just doing rounds, 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 rounds. Right. Because I have the judo. It's just everything else I need to work on better. Like my life is outside of judo. Uh, my gym, my, like everything else. I think if I have the judo, just everything else needs to be better. Right. And and if you were talking to uh, little, little Shadi Al Nahas, who's living in Toronto now that you don't know, um, and you were to give them something like, and you were to say, if, if not the, there's no secret sauce, but you know, if you're 12 and you think that they want to be as good as you, what would you say? Like, maybe here's something that might help you do that. Is it to make sure that you try to keep an attitude that judo's fun and don't try to turn it into a job too young or. I'm going to be realistic. Judo is not going to be fun all the time. Sometimes mm -hmm. I hate judo. It's normal. It's part of like everything else in life. Uh, it's hard, but I think just believing in yourself honestly as cliche as it sounds mm -hmm. if you believe you're gonna be world champion olympic champion qualify to the olympics whatever your goal is just believe in yourself and don't let even if you lose 100 times go to every tournament thinking you're the best out there you're the best they are gonna go and kill everybody because if you don't have that mentality you're gonna lose right yeah yeah that makes it's it's like um you know, our body is a puppet to our mind. Yeah. So, like a, yeah, it's not being cocky. It's just when you're a fighter, you have to fight with your ego a little bit mm -hmm. because you're fighting another person who's trying to throw you on the floor. Uh, so you have to use your ego. Be like, okay, I'm not letting this person get to me. And I'm right. the one who's going to beat him. And I right. think that how you should just got to believe you can do everything you set your mind to. Right. And is, do you have any, do you have any tricks? Because obviously it can be difficult or, or 
techniques. Like it can be obviously difficult to continue to believe in yourself when in judo and what I tell people too about judo, one thing about judo is not only do you lose, but someone physically beat you. Yeah. You yeah. land on your back. You got choked. You got pinned. You got arm burned. Someone physically beat you up, which makes an extra layer. So is there anything that you do in terms of like when you're getting ready for a match, do you listen to a favorite song that makes you confident? Do you focus on your posture when you walk out to the match? Do, what techniques do you have to continue to be confident in yourself when it's a tougher uh, just blip? Two days before the competition, that's when I'm like trying to, to hype myself up to think i'm gonna beat everybody so that's when uh, i think it matters the most when you're competing just go with the flow and do do what you want mm -hmm. but of course i think just your attitude towards yourself is gonna radiate on everybody else you know right right awesome man well thank you so much for uh you for taking the time me. i i enjoyed it i hope you enjoyed it as well and i can't wait to see uh the upcoming events and uh and the next, I mean, I, I, I often really enjoy watching worlds sometimes more than Olympics. So I'm really looking forward to seeing worlds. And, um, I really hope George Fonseca loses. Maybe he can make the final just so you can beat him in the final. I, make I'll it beat him anytime, anytime, any place, yeah. anywhere. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. Take care.